It's been a week for us. Kelly and I last week, and this time we're in church in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, in the Gatlinburg Convention Center with 5,998 other brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, worshiping together, listening to music. I pray. I prayed this morning in our pre-service huddle that uh, if if my soul could be seen as a bucket, let's say a five-gallon bucket from it's it's orange because I got it from Home Depot. Let's just say. Last weekend, God was filling up my soul bucket with encouragement and blessing and reminders of his love and his grace and his mercy and his sacrifice for my sin, like we've just been talking about. And uh, I came home with a full bucket. I tried to drive real carefully so I wouldn't slosh any of it. But... The cares and the concerns of life are poking holes in the bottom of my bucket. Do you, do you identify with that? And so all the time I'm trying to hold on to the blessings that God has been pouring into my life, they're leaking out faster than I can plug holes. I came in to worship this morning with a bucket almost empty. And I knew it. And I said, God, I need my bucket filled. Can you identify with this? It's why why I don't like to miss a Sunday. Now I know that God doesn't wait until Sunday to fill your bucket. He waits for you to bring him your bucket. When your bucket gets empty, bring it. Don't wait till Sunday. Am I right? Don't wait till Sunday to fill your bucket. I've already wasted several minutes of my preaching time this morning, so, oh, oh, God, do the thing you did for Joshua and make the sun stand still in the sky. (laughs) Thank you. We come to the end this morning of this little mini, mini series in the larger series on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is giving six case studies or examples or illustrations or applications of the principle of the, of the relationship of the law of God to the heart of God's child. And so I want to uh, remind you of this verse from Matthew five seventeen and 18. Do not think, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, to complete them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And then he says in verse 20 of chapter 5, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I've repeated this for now five Sundays. So that I'm really, I know that those, that idea is really deeply set in your minds and in your hearts. Unless my righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the most righteous people that we've ever known... You could put it in these terms. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Reverend Dr. Billy Graham or um, Sister Mother Teresa of Calcutta or any other righteous person that you can think of, if you are not more righteous than the most righteous person who ever lived, you are not righteous enough to go to heaven. How many of you are not righteous enough to go to heaven? I expect to see every hand up, so maybe, maybe I need to meet you. <laughs> Let me uh, handcuff myself to you, and you can drag me with you. <clears throat> okay, and then Jesus gives us six, six case studies, and uh, they have this in common. He says, you have, you have heard it said by the people long ago, this... But I say to you, 
What that means is this. And just when you thought you were going to get some relief from the burden of obeying a heavy commandment, Jesus doesn't lighten it. He makes it heavier, right? This is why a lot of us are feeling kind of beat up from this series of the Sermon on the Mount. And none of you is more beat up than the guy who's doing most of the talking and preparation for this series because I'm preaching to the guy in the mirror. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Cool. But I say to you, Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And I, I love, I love what, what Jesus says. The, the grace of God is so overwhelming that it spills over the people that he has claimed as his own. He pours out his grace and blessing and mercy on the people who are his own. And there's so much of it that even the people who don't acknowledge him at all get some of God's blessing, whether they acknowledge it or not. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He gives sunlight to everybody. Thank God for sunlight. Since I put solar panels on the house, I am thankful for sunlight more than ever. <laughs> As I uh, was preparing this message, the first question I asked myself after reading this verse is, okay, well, who is my enemy? I've reached a point in my life where I don't think I have any active enemies. Anybody want to volunteer? There's an opening. Okay, thank you. Wait a minute. I don't want her as my enemy. Thank you. I had an enemy in high school. I knew he was my enemy because he made sure I knew he was my enemy. But he's gone. I had an enemy in my first church as senior pastor. I had an enemy there. And uh, I knew he was my enemy. At least I thought he was. Now he's gone. I'm out of enemies. So I'm asking, who is my enemy? I was reminded of this question that was asked of Jesus when he said, <clears throat> uh, in answer to the question, what is the greatest commandment? You remember, Jesus said, the greatest commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then he went on and said, oh, and by the way, the second greatest commandment is love your neighbor the way you love yourself. And, and this guy trying to find a loophole, said, well, 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 exactly who is my neighbor? And in answer of that question, Jesus, on the spot, on the spot, made up a story. We call it a parable. And it's one of the most famous parables. If, if you were to go up to a person on the street, not that you would, but if you did, you'd go up to a person on the street and say, can you name three of Jesus' parables? Probably most people would come up with uh, the, the, the prodigal son. That's a pretty famous one. And uh, the good Samaritan. That's so famous we even use it to name hospitals. Here's the good Samaritan, the parable of, of an enemy behaving like a neighbor. Behaving like a brother. And uh, that's what Jesus says is the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? The answer is whoever in the sphere of your influence needs your help. It's what my mother said to me when I asked her who was her favorite child. <laughs> I've told you this story. Some of you remember me telling you this story. I was sure the answer was me. 
but I was also sure she would never admit it in front of witnesses. How could she? So I waited for an opportunity when it was just mom and me. We, I went to the store with her to help her with the groceries. And uh, I s- saw my opportunity and I said, Mom, nobody's listening. I'm not recording this. I'm not wearing a wire. Tell me, honestly, which of your six children is your favorite? And of course I knew that she would now admit to me what everybody suspected, but nobody ever. But what she said to me has never left my thoughts. She said to me, my wise mother, my favorite child is the one who needs me the most right now. That is who your neighbor is. The one who needs you the most right now. And surprisingly, Jesus chose in his story of the Good Samaritan for the person that represented the neighbor to be the most obvious enemy of the Jewish community. A dirty, nasty Samaritan. The despised neighbors of pure Jews. They were the worst. You and I, if Jesus was telling us the parable today, he probably wouldn't choose Samaritan. Maybe he would choose, well, I don't know, socialist. Or some other label that you and I identify as, oh, these are the people we like the least on the planet. If my neighbor can be just about anyone, then it seems to be that my enemy can also be just about anyone. My neighbor. Or my college soccer team teammate. That seems oddly specific. I'm just saying, there was this guy on my soccer team who would not stop flirting with my girlfriend. They were in the same major. They had almost every one of their classes together. He would not leave her alone. Even after I put the ring on her finger, he would not leave her alone. And she said, let's call him Barry. Let's call him Barry Hauser. Barry, I am engaged. And he said to her, well, you're not married yet. And then Kelly made one of the very few mistakes she's ever made in her whole life. She told me what he said. My sister almost caused me to stumble. (laughs) Upon hearing this, I went to have a talk with my soccer teammate, Barry Hauser. (laughs) It was going to be a strong talk, but not very long. It wasn't going to take very long to have that interaction. Back in those days, we had uh, dorms that were converted to bedroom apartments, and everybody in the dorm had five roommates. And uh, when I got to Barry's dorm room, I was met at the door by his five roommates who said, We're not going to let you have a strong talk with Barry. I didn't didn't know how many of them it was going to take to keep me from that strong talk, but I knew how many of them they were going to use. They were going to use five. And so I said, "Um, okay, forget it. 
I'm not going to have this strong talk. And to this day, that strong talk has never been had. Probably good for both of us. But from that day on, Barry was my enemy. We were teammates. But now he was my enemy. I'm over it now. (laughs) No, really. I'm over it. But every time I smell brute aftershave, (laughs) scent, scent is the strongest sense linked to memory. We're told that. Every time I smell brute aftershave, I'm right back in that college dorm room. This got me thinking about how we view those with whom we disagree. Whether it's about sports or whether it's about politics or whether it's about exactly where the property line that separates two adjoining properties lies. That sounds strangely specific too, doesn't it? Maybe sometimes this question includes employers and employees or co-workers. Sometimes it spills over into brothers and or sisters and parents and or children and husbands and or wives. I'm learning to speak Spanish. I've been learning for a long time. I've, I've been making a little bit of progress. And when I, when I learned that the word for friend in Spanish is amigo. I knew that. I mean, everybody who watches TV or movies knows that. Then I learned that the Spanish word for enemy is, some of you probably know this, enemigo. Amigo, enemigo. They sound very similar, don't they? And that kind of betrays the truth that sometimes the line between friend and enemy is dotted. From time to time, maybe only for a moment, even those that I hold dearest can seem like my enemy. Do I dare to say that sometimes, on the rarest of occasions, We might even perceive God to be our enemy. Especially when he's keeping us from getting or having that thing we want. Or have convinced ourselves that we need. Or he has taken away from us something or even worse, someone. So Jesus' words to us about how to deal with our enemies... Love your enemy, pray for him. Might be understood, might be understood by some as how should I deal with the Roman soldiers tramping through my garden? Or it might also be how to deal with the man who is trying to steal the woman you love away from you. Maybe it might even include how to deal with the Boston Red Sox fans among us. Or how to deal with this pastor who said something I did not like or agree with two weeks ago or five minutes ago or five minutes from now. When Jesus tells me that I'm supposed to love my enemy, pray for the one who is persecuting me or troubling me or cheating on me or taking from me what is mine or riding around town with a bumper sticker uh, for a, uh, in support of a political candidate or a cause or an issue that I despise, and so on, etc., etc. Love your enemy. Let's go to the next verse. For Jesus says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that? This is really a revolutionary idea. What I want to do to my enemy is poke him in the eye. Either physically or metaphorically. 
But Jesus calls me to be different than this. He tells me that he wants me to be different than everybody else who just go about doing just exactly what comes naturally to, the, to them, what comes the most easily to them. Pastor Tim talked last week, well, gave a great sermon about uh, repaying evil for evil, taking revenge, striking back at the one who strikes at you. Jesus doesn't want me to do things the way everybody else does them. He calls me to do things the way God wants them done, which is almost never the way we're doing it. You think about it, the majority is usually wrong. We believe in the majority rule, but the majority is almost always wrong. Crucify. Thy will, God, thy will, God, be done right here on earth, right now, the way it is done in heaven. And Jesus then says, and if you greet only your brothers, what, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? So even tax collectors... And Gentiles, bleh, even they are nice to people who are nice to them. Or people who they have to be nice to, like relatives. <laughs> you know, it's funny because we're, we're still learning how to be nice to each other. Never mind how to be nice to our enemies. We're still learning and working on how to love each other well. But now we have to go past that and say, we're supposed to be loving the people we don't love and don't want to love. Who's on that list for you? It's not particularly godly to be nice to people who are nice to you. Anyone can do that. In fact, almost everyone already does that. What sets apart Christ followers is our occasional ability, occasional ability, when we're empowered by the Holy Spirit of God living in us to enable us to do the extraordinary. And Jesus gave us an example. You're familiar with this. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is Jesus' example of what he means when he tells us to love our enemies. And to pray for them who despitefully use us and to persecute us and to mock us and to disregard us or in some other way seek to harm us. But you might say to me, hey, wait a minute, time out. That's Jesus. He's not the ordinary, typical human being. Yes, he's fully man, but he's also got the fully God thing going on. And you can't expect me to do what Jesus could do. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you about that. Because I don't expect that I will always do what Jesus always did. But I want to. He has this advantage over us. He's God and we're not. How in the world can he expect this kind of response from me? Well, it is possible, though it isn't easy. I know it's possible because we've seen it happen. Let me share with you this modern day example. 2006, October, tragic shooting in the Amish school near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That's old news. That happens every week now. That's horrible, isn't it? 16 years ago, this gunman came into this 
Amish elementary school in uh, Bart Township, Lancaster County, the old order, the old order Amish community of nickel mines. He took hostages and of the 10 girls between the ages of 6 and 13 that were in school that day, he shot eight of them and killed five of the eight before taking his own life in the schoolhouse. <sighs> why, I'm reminding of this, why I'm reminding us of this horrible event today is not because of the event, but the response to the event. The response of this, uh, this Amish community is what everyone in the country was talking about. Every news media outlet was talking about this story. Because the Amish community, this peculiar faith community, did what Jesus said we're supposed to do. As a community, they forgave. They didn't seek vengeance. They didn't seek justice. What more justice could there be anyway? This man who did this terrible evil thing was already standing before God for judgment. That doesn't mean they didn't grieve. <laughs> Imagine not grieving. It doesn't mean that every member of the community easily came to this position, but sometimes it takes a village. Sometimes, sometimes it takes my brothers and sisters standing beside me, propping me up, helping me to do what we all know is the right thing to do. I don't have the strength to do it alone. But together, As an entire community, they publicly forgave the one who brought this terrible tragedy on them. They tore down the building. Would you put that next picture up, please? They tore this school building down. They would not leave a visible reminder of an injury. That doesn't mean they forgot. You can't forget. I'm not letting you forget. I'm reminding you. But they tore down this monument of evil. And they rebuilt a school in a different location. And they named this school New Hope School. This faith community. Mock them, ridicule them think they're quaint, old-fashioned, whatever you want to think. This community did what God's Word told them to do. It can be done. It's not easy. Anybody tell you this was going to be easy? I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. Isn't that... But... But how do you fight the Amish community's response? How do you criticize that? How do you oppose that kind of meekness? Blessed are the meek who do not insist on getting what is coming to them. God calls us to walk a different path. He sets before us a higher standard by which we must weigh and measure our thoughts, our attitudes, our responses, our actions. And then he gives us a summary statement, which encompasses all six of these case study applications. Before I read that last verse, I want to remind you of this verse, Matthew 5.20. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus gives us six very specific applications of this principle that shines a laser-focused 
beam of light into the darkest recesses of our own hearts and then summarizes these lessons with this most condemning statement of all. You therefore must be, say it with me, perfect. As your heavenly Father is perfect to get to heaven. You must be perfect. Now you all already admitted that you're not. I certainly am not. And even if I was perfect from here on out to the rest of my life, I still got this train of baggage I'm dragging behind me. This is not a new idea. And I'm going to have to invite you to take the bulletin and look up the references that I published there. I'm not going to take the time this morning because I'm already out of time. But starting in Genesis 17, 1, God said to Abram, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And then he said it again in Leviticus, be holy for I am holy. And again, later in Leviticus, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And Deuteronomy, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. And then Jesus said, be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Have God's kind of mercy on people around you. Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God. Be like God. So many. This is not a dynamically new idea. God introduced it into the thoughts of his followers as early as Abraham. And has consistently repeated it over and over and over again. I am your God. Be like me. I can't. Okay. God has given us the resources. Ephesians 4 talks about giving us apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers to help us to learn how to follow and how to grow to maturity. And so you, you might say, okay, uh, okay, Pastor Dennis, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Come to church. Listen to the sermons. Take notes. Read my Bible. Start reading it every day. Pray more. Attend Bible studies. Join a home group. Do Christian stuff. Change my preset radio stations to Christian programming. Start volunteering in Kingdom Kids or in the food pantry or as a greeter or as a part of our safety and service team. What's the safety and service team? You'll find out. Sign up and take a meal to someone who is homebound or ill or recovering from surgery or any of a hundred other things that we might do. To become more intentional about being a committed and faithful follower of Jesus. Are you serious about following Jesus? Are you content to be a Sunday morning fan? Or do you want to be a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all day, every day, 24-7, 365, follower of Jesus? Is that enough? No. The last verse, I want to end on this, the last verse from Galatians 5.16. This is what we really need. But I say to you, walk by the Spirit of God. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Ted's talking back. Ted talk. <laughs> last weekend, Kelly pointed at a t-shirt at, uh, at the product table of one of the gospel music groups that was there. She said, I like that t-shirt, and uh, I like the color of it, and uh, they had one in my size, so I bought it. I wasn't going to, uh, I didn't want to wear it. I didn't want to wear a t-shirt to church, but I'm just going to describe it to you. It says across the front, trust God, and then underneath it, it says, and take another step. 
Trust God and take another step. Walk by the Spirit. Take the step He sets in front of you. Trust Him that that step is the right step and then take it. And then do it again. And do it again until you're developing a pattern of walking by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, help us. Because being perfect is not in our skill set. There are too many holes in the bottoms of our buckets. And the cares and the concerns of life are sapping out the blessings of mercy and grace that you are pouring into our lives. By the Holy Spirit, help us. Plug those holes in us. Help us to trust you and take the next step. In Jesus' name, amen. I am bound, I am 
time, I am down. I am. I am down. I am down for the promised land. Amen. God, we long for that day when we'll be in your presence. In the meantime, here we are. So what, what would you have us do with our, the days that remain? I guess we could start by doing a little better at loving our enemies and praying for those that persecute us as much as that is so counter to our nature. Can't do that without you. Can't do that without your strength, without your help, without your guidance. So give us the grace we need to, to chase that. Help us. Keep us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.